The cross of Christ is the central point of humanity, of history. The Old Testament looks forward to it. As Christ comes to this world, it was for the purpose of dying upon the cross. The New Testament thus centers upon it. And we still are to preach that cross. As Paul went out preaching, as he writes in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18, that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us that are saved it is the power of God. And thus, in chapter 2 and verse 2, he says, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Thus, as we go back to what Luke wrote in Luke 23 and verse 33, where it says that they came to the, to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified Him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand, the other on the left. That phrase, there they crucified Him, we've been looking at that. The first week we looked at the place. It was there. The place called Golgotha or Calvary, the place of the skull. But as Hebrews 13 points out, it was outside of the gate, which is a highly significant phrase because it becomes the antitype of the sin offering that took place on the Day of Atonement during the Old Testament period or the Law of Moses but it also implies being an outcast, condemned as a criminal, as Jesus was. It also implies a rejection by the people, that Jesus came into his own and his own received him not, John 1 and verse 11. And thus, there they, the people, who were responsible and we looked at the Jewish leaders were responsible, as were the Romans, both from the soldiers, but also they acting under the governmental authority and Pontius Pilate. The Jews were responsible for it, as was God himself. It was done by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Jesus himself placed himself upon the cross. He could have, as Brother Brantley mentioned, taken his life or lay it down. He decided to lay down his life for us. But then that brings us to that last point that we made each one of us. Place Jesus upon the cross. Our sins. And so for us to have the remission of those sins... Jesus went to the cross. But next we see that word crucified. This is the penalty. Crucifixion was invented by the Persians, but it was perfected by the Romans. It literally was a torturous way to die. It has been universally considered as the most horrible death that's ever been devised by man. The suffering was intense, especially in climates that were hot. The Lexan Bible Dictionary states that, quote, everything was done to humiliate and dishonor the victim, a addition to torturing him or her to death, end quote. You know, in our society here in the United States of America, we have, to the best of our ability, sanitized capital punishment in the few times that it's taken place. Now, I say sanitized from the standpoint, we don't want anything bad to happen to them. We don't want them to suffer any pain or anguish or anything else. And so now then, the favorite method, I guess, is that of injection, where they inject a medication into an individual, and the individual just goes to sleep, and then the other medications uh, stop the heart. Don't want him to feel any pain, any anguish. 
And usually it's done behind closed doors where no one could see. No one knows about it except they come out and make an announcement that he died. The Romans, if you look at ours and you look at the Romans, the Romans were the exact opposite. They wanted to do everything possible that they could do to humiliate and torture the individual. Including, and we'll uh, deal with some of these ideas as we go through this lesson, they put it in the most public place that they could find. If they knew that people were going to be passing by that way, that's where they wanted it to take place. For everyone to see. It was not something that was some, uh, just every once in a while that took place either. It was something that was very commonly practiced. There's record that one individual crucified 2,000 people and placed them on the Appian Way which was the place in which people would travel through Italy. 2,000 people lining the street. Crucifixion was considered the death of a slave. Roman citizens were normally exempt from crucifixion. Because even the Romans, now this is the Romans dealing with their citizens, not with anyone else, but their own citizens, it was too barbaric for their citizens. And so basically, they were exempt from it. It only applied to freed men in cases such as robbery, assassination attempts, or assassination, piracy, perjury, treason, crimes such as that. In fact, uh, the idea of assassination, there's uh, records in which an individual owner of several slaves was put to death by one slave, the entire house was crucified, everyone in it, because of that assassination. Even though only one individual did it, everyone suffered the same death of crucifixion. There was a sequence of events that are common among Roman crucifixion. And we'll go back and look at these, but uh, there are basically four aspects. First, the victim is tortured by various means. Second, the victim then had to carry the crossbeam. It's called the uh, patibulum. It was only the crossbeam. It was not the entire cross, but that crossbeam to the place of crucifixion. Third, the victim was then attached by either ropes or nails to the crossbeam. And then fourth, the crossbeam and victim were then raised to the wooden post or the tree and fastened to it. Occasionally, the post would have a wooden seat called a sidel for the victim to sit on. Uh, through the years, I've heard of uh, where they would have a little uh, ledge that was placed under the foot. Apparently, that was not the case, but they do have historical evidence that there was one in which they sat on. And the individual and sitting on it then was basically turned a little bit so that the spike that was through the feet went through the side of the feet and not the actual 
what we would think of the feet. The pre-crucifixion pre torture, those were the four things that are common to all of the crucifixions, basically. When you go to that pre-crucifixion pre torture, it usually involved flogging. Uh, we generally use the term scourging today. But it could also include burning, racking, mutilation, and also abuse of the victim's family as he was there and his family abused as well. Plato, even though he was actually before the Roman period, he was a Greek, described it in this way, quote, a man is racked, mutilated, has his eyes burned out, and after having all sorts of great injuries inflicted on him and having seen his wife and children suffer the like, is at last impaled, that's the idea of crucified, or tarred and burned alive. Now that's the way in which he described that pre-crucifixion torture. Man is racked, mutilated, eyes burned out, all sorts of injuries afflicted on him, including having seen his wife and children suffer the same things. As I said, the Romans were quite uh, the opposite of what we try and do today. The hanging itself. They were stripped of all clothing. Now, when we see pictures depicting the crucifixion, there's always a loincloth that is put on the one who is representing the Christ for modesty's sake. There was no modesty given to that one who was being crucified. He was stripped of all clothing. He had nothing on. Nails more of what we would think of as spikes, were driven into his hands. Now we say hands, but the Roman definition of a hand extended up into the forearm area. And so any of this part would include the hands. And it was not done in the palm of the hands as is so many times depicted. That going in a spike through that area would not hold the weight of the individual. It would tear out. They would go in through this area, again, what we might refer to as the wrist or even the forearm. That was the Roman hand. It included the hand. And so it would go through here and the weight then could be held by the bones of the wrist. One foot would then be placed upon or on top of the other, and a nail would be driven through both feet into the wood. Of course, this places the body in a very unnatural position and would cause pain from the slightest of movement. That's why it was so torturous. The hands and feet really are filled with nerve endings. Um, supposedly, and I, I don't know the accuracy of this, but they used to say people who have migraines, you could rub right in this area of the hand, and eventually you could get rid of the migraine. The feet, there's even today those who rub the feet because it affects every part of the body. Well, there are also the nerve endings. And, you know, if you prick your fingertip and how much that hurts, but you get a cut, you know, someplace else and you hardly feel it. Why? Because the nerve endings 
are there. And so those areas of the body are going to cause increased pain and intense pain. When we see the cross or Christ and the depiction of it, generally we see someone who is very high off of the ground. That was not the way in which the Romans did it. He was very low to the ground, almost touching the ground. Not quite, but no more than maybe a foot off of the ground. Now then, one of the reasons to place the victim so low to the, to the ground was to allow animals, dogs, and such to come and gnaw at the feet and legs of the victim. A man named Pseudomantheo who lived in the third century, described how it must have looked when he said, quote, Punished on their tortured bodies, they see the stake, that is cross, as their fate. In the bitterest of torment, they have been fastened with nails to become evil banquets for birds and terrible scraps for dogs. Seneca, who lived in the first century, said or wrote this about it. Can anyone be found who would prefer wasting away in pain, dying limb by limb, or letting out his, letting out his life drop by drop rather than expiring all at once? Can a man be found willing to be fastened to the accursed tree, long, sickly, already deformed, swelling with ugly tumors on chest and shoulders, and draw the breath of life amid long, drawn-out agony." End quote. While we mentioned the pre- crucifixion tortures, oftentimes instead of the family being tortured during that pre-crucifixion, instead the family would be executed or tortured in the victim's side as he hung upon the cross. Death rarely came before three days, and it often lasted much longer. Sometimes eight, nine, or ten days someone would be alive on the cross. Death was the result of the loss of blood circulation followed by coronary failure. Or, it would come through the collapse of one's lungs, causing suffocation and asphyxiation. Uh, some people, without even the torture and such, have died because of the arms being outstretched and continued in that position too long. The Lexan Bible Dictionary summarized because in reality there would be various things that they put it, quote, it is quite likely that different individuals died from different uh, physiological causes, end quote. Some might die from heat exposure, some from asphyxiation and suffocation, others blood loss and such. So it would be a variety of things that people died for. After they died, they were often just simply left on the cross, left there to become food for the dogs and the birds 
the scavenger animals, which, as I mentioned, oftentimes started feasting on them prior to their death. After the crucifixion, then the body was treated in one of three ways. One, the body was left on the cross to rot and for the animals, as we mentioned. Second way is that it was taken down and abused, oftentimes being drugged through the streets and then thrown into a mass grave. The third way in which that, the body would be treated is that on occasion it was handed over to a family member for burial. Now then, with that as a background of simply crucifixion, we look at Christ's crucifixion because there they crucified him. As normal, it was preceded by torture. He was scourged and mocked. Just from the hands of the Romans, this is after he has been smitten and spat upon by the Jews. It talks about his dealings with the soldiers of Pilate. That Matthew 27, starting in verse 27, going through verse 30 says, Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus... He delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put, on his, put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And so Jesus endured those pre-crucifixion torture and the scourging by itself would oftentimes kill an individual. It was an instrument in which they could literally beat a person to death. It was what we would think of to a great extent as a cat of nine tails. And at the end of each of those leather thongs, they would tie pieces of bone or rocks or pieces of metal. And... Generally, they had one on each side beating the person, one side and then the other. And those pieces of bone or rocks or whatever it might be that was tied to the end would first bruise and then cut into the flesh. Thus, the death of many individuals. The second thing that we noted, though, about crucifixions is that the individual, the victim, had to carry his cross. And it records in John, the 19th chapter, in verse 17, And he, talking about Jesus, bearing his cross, went forth into the place called the place of the skull, which is, in, is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. And so Jesus, as was the common practice, began carrying the cross, or that patabellum, the cross beam. However, we find in Matthew 27 and verse 32, And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And so now then, as they're coming out, Simon of Cyrene is forced to carry the cross or that patabellum of Christ. It's supposed, thus, that Jesus fell under the weight of that cross beam. And so, as a result of that, they then find Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross for him. 
that cross beam generally weighs, they, according to some reports, anywhere from 100 to 150 pounds by itself, in which he would be carrying, and in his weakened condition, thus, in all probability, fell under its load and under the weight of it. As far as the crucifixion itself, it would have been, to a great extent, a normal crucifixion. They attaching him to the cross by means of the nails through his, what we would say, wrist, the hands, and then upon the, uh, lifting him up onto the, the post, and then affixing his feet to that post. But, Something unusual happened with Jesus, and that is death came very quickly. He died within a few hours, whereas normal crucifixions would take days normally, seldom dying before three days, sometimes lasting over a week to a week and a half. But Jesus died quickly. In Mark, the 15th chapter, in verse 44, it says that Pilate marveled if he was already dead. He called unto him the centurion, centurion, asking him whether he had been any while dead. See, he was surprised. You mean he's already dead? That was unusual. He marveled that it was so quick because... It didn't take place that soon, that quickly. But as a result of his quick demise, the soldiers did not have to break his legs as they did the two malefactors that were crucified on either side of him. Because they were going to, they at least showed the Jews deference to their belief in regards to someone being on the cross on the Sabbath day. And they did not want that. And so to give in to the Jews in that point, they would break the legs of the victim to prevent him from breathing and hasten death. They didn't have to do that with Jesus because he died so quickly. After his death, the post-crucifixion, his body was then given to Joseph of Arimathea. In Matthew, the 27th chapter, and verses 57 through verse 59, it says, And when even was come, and there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered, and when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped him in a clean linen cloth. And so, of those three ways in which the body was treated, either to leave the body on the cross, to take him down and mutilate and the body, sometimes dragging it through the streets, which would serve as a warning to others, and then leaving him in a mass grave, here's Joseph of Arimathea going to Pilate, asking for the body, and Pilate giving the body to Joseph. And in Matthew 27 and verse 60, it records that Joseph laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. So here's Joseph putting Jesus in his own, but it's a new tomb. And that becomes important because when Jesus is raised from the grave, there's no bones left in that tomb. If there had been other bodies that had been died prior to that and placed in that tomb, they could have said, well, those are the bones of Jesus and could have been thus denying the resurrection. But in this case, there's no bones there because no one has been laid in that tomb before. And thus, when Jesus on that third day is raised from the grave, 
by the power of God. The apostles on that day of Pentecost could have said, we can go to the tomb. It's empty. And that empty tomb served as a proof and evidence that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the grave. But what he endured for us, willingly suffering the torment of the cross, so we might be saved. And he asked us to be obedient to him, to do what he says in becoming a Christian through our faith that he died for our sins, through our repenting of our sins, turning away from them to, talk, to turn and to walk in the ways that God would have us to live, to make a confession of our faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then being placed under the water, baptism, for the remission of our sins, so that we might have those sins washed away by the blood which he shed upon that Calvary's tree. And then, after we come up out of that watery grave of baptism, we walk in the way in which he wants us to walk. We walk in the light as he is in the light. And when we, as Christians, go astray, that we know that we have that opportunity to repent and come back in time. Make things right with those that we've sinned against. And if public sin, public confession of faith, or public confession of sin, and church praying with us for the forgiveness of them. Why? Because of the hope that we have through that death of Jesus Christ and His being raised from the, from the grave. If you need to be obedient to Him this morning, we would encourage you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song.